Welcome and thanks for joining me. In this video I want to focus on the year 1838 and the events that happened during that year. Now I didn't want to go with the mainstream story that you might know and hopefully there's a few details that you were not aware of. I've decided to shoot this video indoors due to the weather of the day. Um, I'm here at the Snowflake building in Portugal, a very historic building. Um, it has been revamped and it is still in use today for recreational purposes um, with a coffee shop as well that you can visit at any time. So yeah, thank you and I hope you enjoy. My forefathers are buildings in the sand They left a thousand ruins across the land I love them deep like salt, they feel bitter on my skin I believe in pleasure they believe in sin Listen to the crying in the street All the lonely people that you meet Children of the change caught like rats in a trap But the little ones are dancing to the choco box rap Now in order to understand the year 1838, first we need to have a look at the Zulus and who they as a people were. They were very superstitious and believed that bad luck is a sign from their ancestors that they were not pleased and unhappy. They believed that a bad spirit can be sent to you in the form of a tokoloshi to bring bad luck upon you or your family. They believed in the Sangoma, the traditional doctor, and the healing properties that his medicine has. In a medical journal dating back to 1899, the doctor wrote that he once observed a Sangoma cutting and peeling away the skin on the skull in order to scratch a headache. In this journal, much more gruesome events are described on their operation and childbirth methods. This was a tribe of people who were in constant conflict with neighboring tribes. Now this was not entirely about racial differences, but merely a struggle for power and land. And for the Zulus, well, they just wanted to destroy anything foreign. But that was the way Dengan was, the king of the Zulu nation at that time. He sought only to confirm his way by destroying anything foreign, with ruthless cruelty. Shaka, his brother and predecessor, who he had assassinated, was in a way a better leader and strived for universal domination. When Shaka ruled, he once killed 3,000 women and children of warriors that did not succeed in battle. Now after Dengan assassinated Shaka and he won the deal with his other brother, a lot of the Zulus left Natal. Um, because they did not like the way he ruled the kingdom. The fact of the matter is that this was a tribe that experienced everyday life in a whole different mindset than the Boers and the British at that time. People with a totally different background crossed paths in a time where bloodshed was not uncommon. So in the year 1837, after the Voortrekkers had travelled north beyond the Orange and the Vaal River, their progress was stopped when they encountered the Matabele and they had a conflict with Chief Mzilikatse and the tribe. Now the Matabele was an offshoot of the Zulu nation and their name literally means those who have disappeared. The Voortrekkers also found the Transvaal ill adapted for their pastoral occupation, so they turned eastwards and crossed the Drakensberg. Now in the year 1838 there were a few missionaries in Natal, and a certain Reverend Owen took up a doe near Ungungungluvu on the Mfulosi River. Now this was considered part of the Zulu Empire, but scarcely anyone was left when the Voortrekkers arrived in the area. It was therefore proposed by the Voortrekkers to ask Tengan for a piece of this land in return for the constant alliance and assistance from the Voortrekkers. 
Peter Teeth opened the negotiations with the assistance of Reverend Owen and soon they left for the Royal Court at Ungungungluvu, which means the place of the trumpeting elephant. Dungan mentioned that some of his cattle were stolen by people riding on horses, carrying guns and wearing clothes. Now Peter Teeth assured him that this was not the fur trackers, but according to his knowledge this was the work of the tribe called the Montetees, living in the uplands west of the Drakenberg. Retief agreed to retrieve this cattle from the Montetees in exchange for uh, the settlement on the land where they came across the Drakensberg. So Peter Retief, with 600 Boers and 40 of their servants, all heavily armed, set out to retrieve the cattle from the Montatees. They defeated the Montatees and took about 7,000 cattle and 60 horses and a few guns. Now Lungan was very pleased with this, but he also wanted the horses and the guns, which Retief said no, it belongs to the Boers. Lungan appeared satisfied and he promised them the land, stretching from the Tugela to Umzimbubu. Retief agreed upon this and the treaty was signed on the 6th of February 1838. Now the Boers were at the crawl for about two days, camping outside under two mulch trees. They walked around unarmed with the guns under the supervision of the servants. William Wood, a translator of Ngan, wrote that on the third day he perceived the change in Ngan's manner and he knew he was planning something. He went to warn the Boers but they ignored this. A short time after this, Ngan came out of his hut and ordered out two of his regiments. He called for the Boers to wish them a farewell on their journey back home. All the Boers gathered except for two or three servants who were ordered to collect the horses. The Zulus started dancing and within a short while he ordered his men to seize them. The Zulus stormed and overwhelmed the Boers. Thomas Halstead managed to get his pocket knife out and kill two Zulus before he himself was overpowered. The Boers' hands were tied behind their backs and they were dragged to a rocky cliff by as many Zulus that can get to one. The only order that Ngan gave was Bulala Amatakati, which means kill the wizards. You see, the Zulus believed that the Boers had supernatural powers and they were afraid of this. The Boers were led to this small rocky cliff where they were stoned and hit with knockeries until everyone was dead. Peter Retief was forced to watch all his men being killed while he was executed last. Reverend Owen was staying in a hut just at the foot of this hill and he witnessed everything. After the massacre, Retief's heart and liver was removed, wrapped in cloth and took to Dungan. He and two of his captains conversed in the hut for about two hours. Now during that time it is possible that some of the organs were consumed, like they did with Hendrik Potgieter in 1854. Chief Mokopani thought that he would become as strong as Herman Potgieter. Um, if he ate it. 
the liver of Owe. After the Gon conversed with the captains, he ordered the Zulus to attack the wives and the children of the Boers that were left a safe distance from the camp in the area where they came across the dragon's back. A large group of men were immediately in readiness, singing and dancing, we will go and kill the white dogs. A short time after the party, they set off with great speed in the direction where the wagons were and they arrived the morning of the 17th of February 1838. Now the result of this attack is very well known and it is even depicted on a mural in the Voortrekker monument. The Boers who were guarding the wagons were taken by surprise and hundreds of women and children were inhumanely murdered but not without retribution as a number of Zulus were also slain. Now all the families camped out over quite a large area between the Blaukrans and the Busmans River and between two side branches from the Blaukrans River, the Klein Moortspreit and the Groot Moortspreit. From different sources I was able to pin the locations of roughly where the families camped out. The De Beer, Liebenberg and Bester families camped out where the Blaukrans River and Klein Moortspreit joins. The Rousseau family were to the west of them. The Boeta, Breitenbach and Smit families camped out where the Blaukrans and Grootmoot spread the joints. Further downstream were the Greilings and Engelbrechts and to the southwest of the Grootmoot spread were the Prinsle and Van der Merwe families. The Greilings and Engelbrechts were warned in time and went to seek refuge at the Rousseaus, but all were overpowered and killed. From the Prinsle and Van der Merwe families, only two children survived the attack, Margareta Prinsle and Johanna van der Merwe, with more than 20 stab wounds each from an Asagai. They survived by hiding and crawling under the dead bodies around them. Now all the campsites were left in ruins by the Zulus, except to those to the west. 196 Voortrakkers went to seek refuge at Doerenkop at the lager that was set up there. Now the decision was made to launch a counter-attack against the Zulus. Four groups of men headed east um, and assisted Boers along the way. At the Tugela River they found a large group of Zulus with about 25,000 cattle and about 2,000 horses that they took from the Boers. The animals already crossed the river, um, but most of the Zulus drowned while they were trying to escape um, from the Boers. More than 500 individuals lost their lives that morning of the 17th of February 1838. Half of them were hot notes that were household help to the Boers and 185 were children. Now these were the events that set the stage for December 1838. The Brewers realized that the only way to be successful against an army that totally outnumbers you is to choose the location that suits you best and to set up in a lager that the Asahais can't reach through. Ten months later, this was put to the test at Blood River and the Brewers were successful. In a future episode, I will um, cover that topic. But for now, thank you very much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, I'll see you in the next one.